Uwaga, uwaga, which is, of course, Polish for Achtung, Achtung. Um, welcome to this very, very special edition of We Have Ways of Making You Talk. And we've chosen Polish with our guest in mind. Uh, joining us is the author, Philippe Sands, who has written two of the most remarkable books in recent times. Uh, four years ago, East West Street told the story of both Philippe's family history, particularly his grandfather and grandmother, but also the story of the Nuremberg trials and the development of human rights law. And now we have the follow-up, The Rat Line, which uh, tells the story of uh, Otto Wächter and his wife Charlotte, both avowed Nazis and Otto's attempt to evade justice after the war. Um, Philippe, welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Um, you're, you're, of course, um, a, a podcasting megastar in your own right uh, with, with The Rat Line, which has been a massive success, hasn't it? Well, I wouldn't put it like that, but I am <laughs> thrilled to be on this podcast with you two fellows because I've listened to it and I enjoy it and of course your title could not be more apt well I've got to say (laughs) someone tipped me off and said have you heard the rat line I went no um uh, and I I listened to it and my god I literally just sat through the whole lot I was utterly gripped and I've I think I then wrote you a rather p- pathetic um, fan email saying how much I loved it, but I thought it was just completely fantastic. I, I, I got a gripping. lovely email from you, but I got a lovely email from you. But of course, the real test in my household, as in many households, is the wife. And the test for us was as follows: We were driving to Wales for a weekend, and I just had the first cut from our wonderful producer Gemma Newby, and I said, "Would you like to listen to the?" would you like to listen to the first episode? And she sort of said, well, okay, let's listen to the beginning and see how it goes. And after episode four, she said, no, no, I've got to carry on listening. And she is a very tough cookie. So if I've (laughs) cracked my wife... Well, there you are. I've made it. Well, this... Well, this this podcast means that I'm um, off in my office for an hour out of my partner's hair, so it works differently in this household. <laughs> put it that way. Now, um, the, the, now the the rat line is really the sort of s- second instalment of a, of the of the developing story that starts with East West Street, isn't it? Because your family, Polish Jews, um, inevitably, like so many people, um, caught up in the taken by the Holocaust, and you went looking to find out. The story of Lviv, Lemberg, Lv, Lviv, this town that's had so many names, so many guises. And East West Street is the story of that. How do you even begin to, to embark on that um, uh, journey research-wise? Where do, you, where do you start? Do you start with Hans Frank or do you start with your parents' synagogue? Where do you begin? Uh, grandparents' synagogue? Where do you, you begin? Start, you start by accident. Um, <laughs> the best things in life are <laughs> unplanned. I get this bonkers invitation out of the blue in the spring of 2010, I can remember it like it was yesterday. Would you come to Lviv, to the Faculty of Law, to deliver a lecture on your work on crimes against humanity and genocide? I had never even heard of Lviv. I looked it up on the map. It was Lemberg, Lviv, same place. And the moment I worked out it was Lemberg, I thought, yes, yes. I want to go there. Why do I want to go there? Because my beloved granddad, who I was very close to, he lived until 97, and I knew him very well. He lived in Paris. He was my French granddad. Yeah. Um, Was born there, but he would never talk about it. So I thought, I'll go there, and it will be interesting to see where he comes from, who he is, who I am. And I asked my mum whether she had any documents. I'm, at this point, 50 years old, and my mum has given me nothing. I know nothing about this period. She comes into her living room holding these two big plastic bags, ancient, full of old Nazi passports and travel documents and birth certificates and stuff. And I spend a couple of days going through them, find the address of his house and go off to Lviv, find his house, give my lecture. One thing leads to a lover. I start writing a book about three guys. My grandfather, a man called Hirsch Lauterpacht, who becomes the professor of international law at Cambridge University, who's from Lviv and who invents the concept of crimes against humanity, which is the protection of individuals, and who was a student at the law school that invited me, but the folks who invited me didn't know that. And then Raphael Lemkin, you literally couldn't invent this, who also was a student at the law school, they also didn't know that, and guess what? He invents the concept of genocide. So I start writing a book. It is an incredible series of coincidences, isn't it? Or is it? Or, or is, is it? it? Well, this is it. another family dispute. <laughs> I think it's not. 
I think it's not. I think that there's something else at play. Something but my wife water. thinks I'm a loon. My wife thinks I'm a lunatic. And if I would go down to the movies at Swiss Cottage, she says and stand up at the front of the cinema screen and say, how many people here have got a relative who comes from Lviv? Ten people will put their hands up. <laughs> so um, we have a big fight about this. Anyway, so I'm off writing this book about these three characters. And as I get more and more immersed in it, I discover the terrible events of August 1942, when a man called Hans Frank comes to town. He is the governor general of Nazi-occupied Poland. He has been Adolf Hitler's personal lawyer. He comes to the law faculty, the university that I go to 70 years later, and gives a lecture in the very same room that I will give a lecture 70 years later, unbelievably, but I didn't know it at the time, in which he announces, dear fellow, uh, and he addresses his words to a man in the front row, Otto Wächter, his deputy. What a fine job you've been doing. Um, very soon, none of those flat-footed Indians, i.e. the Jews, will be wandering around here. They'll all be gone. And lo and behold, within a year, they were literally all gone. I mean, half a million people exterminated. So I sort of got interested in this character, Hans Frank. Who is he? What motivated him? Who was he? And I prepare for these types of research, like I'm preparing litigation in an international court or tribunal, I just ask a research assistant, get me everything that's ever been written on Hans Frank. And I chance across a book published in Germany in 1989 called Der Vater, The Father, uh, written by Nicholas Frank, one of the sons of Hans Frank. I track him down. Could I come and meet you? Could we have a natter about your dad? Because the book is unbelievably fascinating. Why? He hates his father. He hates his father so much that when I arrive in Hamburg on the banks of the River Elbe, the wonderful terrace of the Hotel Jacob, one of the finest hotels I've ever been to, the first thing he says to me is, you have to know, Philippe, that I am against the death penalty in all cases except for my father. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a well-trained British person. <laughs> I'm not used to people saying that about their dads. And then he says, then he says... Look at this. And he puts his hand in his pocket and he whisks out a photograph. And it's a photograph of his father's dead body, freshly hanged in Nuremberg. So meet my friend Nicholas, who is then the person who says later in that first conversation, huh, you're interested in Lemberg. Why not visit my friend Horst, the son of Otto Wächter? I say to him, well, why would he want to meet me? He says, he may not, but he's a nice person. You'll see, you will like him. And so begins a lengthy story. I must say that that <laughs> I know you're you're a very, very good friend with, with Nicholas Frank. I, I've I've had the pleasure of yeah, meeting yeah. him um several times and, and becoming a kind of sort of friend with him as well. And he is the most extraordinary person and, and enormously entertaining. He he's a he's a kind of sort of wonderful Bon viveur, and to stand there in Vavil Castle in the apartments where you know he stayed as a as a sort of as a young Nazi child with with his father Hans Frank and his revolting mother, and, and talking through all the the rooms and I remember here and this was the bathroom and this is the only time my father showed me any tenderness and all that. Stuff. I mean, it is it is it is jaw dropping stuff, isn't it? I mean, you know, it, it kind of makes you question everything you you kind of sort of. I don't know, just that sort of, it's that whole Nazi legacy, isn't it? It's just that, that burden that, that seems to weigh down on so many Germans to this day, but particularly, obviously, children of Nazis. I wonder whether you, for you, it's the same experience as me, in a sense. Um, I mean, the, the human level stories are completely fascinating. And these were people who sat at the top table. So they were major, major figures. But being in a place like that, and you're talking about the bathroom of their apartment, I've been there also, and... You can imagine it. You're there with a person who was there as a five-year-old who remembers it like it was yesterday. And it is as though you are in the company of Hans Frank because someone is taking you around, showing you, ah, yes, I remember this corridor. This is what happened. This is where we had lunch. This is where we had supper. This is where my father's office was. This is where the painting um, by Leonardo da Vinci hang. I, I mean, you feel you've got a privileged insight in the company of someone who is himself, it has to be said about Nicholas, a first-class journalist. Um, he was the foreign editor of Stern. I mean, he tells some incredible stories. I don't know if you heard the one about 1989, 1990. 
He's the foreign editor of Stern. He is sent by his magazine to Poland to interview the new president, Lech Wałęsa. <laughs> he goes, I think it's to the Belvedere Schloss, where Wałęsa has his office. And he enters the president's office, and the president is sitting at a round table. And Nicholas says to me, I knew that table. I said, what do you mean? He said, my father chased me around Amazing. that table Absolutely. 70 oh. years earlier. And I say to him, did you tell Valencia that? He said, are you insane? <laughs> Can you imagine how that would have gone down? To tell, to tell the president of Poland who my father was would have been an act of suicide. <laughs> well, I remember... At- Going, doing the tour of Overcastle, and then we went to look at the la- the lady with the ermine, you know, the, the unbelievably exquisite painting. And I was very lucky because, you know, we had the place... There you are. We had the place to ourselves. Yes, exactly. So I, there I was. You're showing up... I should just say that Philippe is showing up a picture of the room with the picture. Anyway, so there was... Nick- well, I'm showing up... What I'm showing up is a picture of the first moment since 1944... And this was, photograph was taken in 2017, 2014. So right. it was exactly 70 years of Nicholas seeing the painting that he grew up with for the first time in 70 years. Right. One of the most famous paintings on planet Earth, The Lady with an Ermine. My God. Well, I remember standing there and, and saying, God, it's just exquisite, isn't it? To be there, it's just, it was just Nicholas and myself in the room. And obviously he then seen it uh, in in 2014 or whenever it was um so he he was sort of got used to the whole thing of seeing it again but i was standing there, i was sort of waxing lyrical about this painting and its exquisiteness and its beauty and all the rest of it and there was this pause and he said yes i rather hate it <laughs> and that was that <laughs> you know because of all the associations but then we went out to the, the you know, there's a sort of i remember there was a sort of corridor and a sort of balcony and you look down into that amazing square and because I was in that zone and I was with Nicholas and because I was thinking about it as it was in the war, all I could see was swastikas hanging down, those big, long ribbon swastikas yeah. hanging down the walls because I'd seen that photo of it. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a very, very strange, strange feeling. But, but f- I'm really glad I had went through that experience. But every moment tells its own story. So the story of that painting is completely fascinating. So Nicholas may well have told you that he, the reason he doesn't like it is when he was a little boy, he thought that Cecilia Gallerani, who is the subject of the painting, was holding a rat. And he didn't realise it was an ermine, and he couldn't understand. But there is something else at play here. The history of this painting, mm. um, and the director of the National Gallery allowed me to spend uh, a, a half hour with it on its own when it was on display in London uh, five, six years ago, is it is a commissioned work of Leonardo by a man of his mistress. So imagine what is actually going on. Hans Frank is making his son look at a painting of a man's mistress whilst Frank himself is having an affair with Lily Grau, his childhood sweetheart, with whom he hoped to reunite he gets in touch with Hitler, and Nicholas may have well shown you the letters and the diaries. It's incredible. Yeah. In the autumn of 42, Frank writes to Hitler and asks for permission to get a divorce from Brigitte Frank, Nicholas's mother. And, Fr- and Hitler says, no, no, not until the war is over. And the idea that in the midst of you know, post-Operation Barbarossa, they're in a major conflict with the the Soviets uh, outside Stalingrad. Hitler is addressing the question of who to give a divorce to at this moment in time is sort of astonishing. Yeah, it truly is. Yeah. Now, now, um, Nicholas's feelings about his father, you, I mean, obviously, you, what was his actual relationship as a boy with his father like? Obviously, his, of, of who he was, of who Hans Frank was and his, and his crimes. But does, did Nicholas arrive at a relationship with his father because his father was, was the starting point that his father was this inattentive, unfaithful man? Or is it, was it taking into account what he found out about him in later life? How did, how did it develop? 
I mean, it's a very interesting question. Um, what is the benefit of hindsight? What is contemporaneous? Nicholas tells one story of the last time he saw his father, which is quite telling. Uh, and it was interesting. It was in his prison cell at Nuremberg shortly before October the 16th, 1946, when uh, Hans Frank was going to be hanged. And he describes going past the prison cell of Goering and of all the others. And having been there, of course, is, is remarkable. And he then, he's with his mother, Brigitte, and they meet with his father. It's the last conversation with the father. And the father says to him, don't worry, son, I'll be home at Christmas. We're going to have a most wonderful Christmas. And the way Nicholas tells it now mm -hmm. is, I knew my father was lying to me. At this extraordinary moment, I was thinking to myself, why can't you at least now be honest with me, be straight with me, yeah. stop the lies, be a real father. Now, who knows whether that is invented later on in life or whether it really happened. But as he tells it, certainly it has the ring of authenticity. Yeah. And I think there was a problem in his relationship with his father, which may, of course, explain why he proceeded to go on and do the things uh, that he did. But uh, but interestingly, right now, I mean, you may have seen James and Al, I don't know, the film uh, that David Evans and I made for BBC Storyville, My Nazi Legacy. Of course. Making that, yeah, yeah. making that film, Horst sud Nicholas suddenly, out of nowhere, actually he gave them to David Evans, the director, I hadn't seen them, paintings that he did at school in about 1944, 1954, when he was 15 years old. Right. They are horrific paintings of corpses, mountains of corpses, people being killed in the most terrible circumstances. And I asked him you were 15 years old, why were you painting that? And he said, well, of course, everyone else at school was painting flowers and mountains and beautiful things, and I was painting corpses. Why were you doing that, Nicholas? Because what was beginning to emerge in our newspapers was photographs of what we had done in Poland, and, of course, I was the prince of Poland, yeah. and I felt implicated by what had happened. And what's interesting here, and it was a really important moment for me, now, I grew up on the other side of the story. I, I grew up with a mum who was a hidden child, who has no memory of anything in the first five, six years of her life, who lives today with that experience. So we got an earful, obviously, of the Germans and what happened to her. And I have to say, I never, I did never think about what it was for people on the other side. And meeting Nicholas was hugely important because for the first time, I could understand what it meant begin to understand, not possibly know, but begin to understand what it meant to grow up with a dad who has been hanged for murdering four million people. I mean, the judgment at Nuremberg, in terms, says we're hanging you because you killed a million Poles and three million Jews. Now, OK, two weeks later, he's hanged, but there's a family life that continues. Yeah. And when Nicholas tells the story of the day of the hanging, he goes to school and the other seven-year-olds in class are taking the piss out of him because his dad's going to be hanged that day. Your heart goes out for this man in his 70s who remembers. We all remember kids taking the piss out of us in the school playground. Everyone's been through that experience. It stays with you forever. But to stay with you forever because your dad's being hanged it is... It's a mind fuck. It's a total fucking mind fuck. Yeah. yeah. Because you can't begin to know what that does to the mind of a seven year old. Knowing that Nicholas has been one of the greatest privileges of my life because I've understood things from a different perspective. He's he's remarkable, uh, and he's you know he's written these these accounts. He's written this book about his father. He's written about this book about his mother, and they they are astonishing books. They're they're, they're kind of you know, and parts of them are kind of unreadable. They're kind of so they're kind of grotesque in parts aren't they and, and do you want uh, do you want to talk about the opening paragraphs on this podcast what's yeah, the yeah, age no, you can, you can, limit you can, yeah. for this podcast oh, no, we're, we're completely open to to i mean we're talking about the way to talk about this subject is to talk about it frankly so what what what, what does he well, say well yeah. the german edition and the english edition are different <laughs> the um Ger the english edition starts with an account of family life the U u.s publisher refused to publish the opening paragraphs or pages of Der Vater by Nicholas Frank for the following reason. Um, and you may be a little surprised by what I'm about to tell you. 
In the opening pages of Der Vater, published in Germany in 1989, Nicholas describes uh, him looking at a photograph of his father as a young man and masturbating uh, and ejaculating over the photograph of his father. Okay, so... Dear God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... Um, and the book about his mother yeah, is, is I, which is... I mean, we should say that it's never been published in the UK. Well, I mean... No, let me, let me just say that when Nicholas first... Uh, so I read... Well, I only read the English version, OK? I managed to get the English version. And I said, well, your book's very interesting. And Nicholas said, I'm furious with the publisher. And I said, why is that? He said, because they refused to publish the opening pages. And I, and I said, well, why would they do that? And he said, I don't know. In Germany, it was fine. But, of course, you meet people in Germany because he's quite famous in Germany. And it's quite entertaining... You'll be having a conversation over dinner um, and someone, he'll, his name will come up and we'll say, oh, yes, he's very famous in Germany. He masturbated over his father's photograph. That's right, <laughs> of course. I mean, so it's... it's um, <laughs> yes, yeah. But, but I don't want to give the wrong impression. He was only 15 or 16 at the time. Yeah. It's not something he does nowadays <laughs> or has done recently. And he doesn't tell the story with pride or hilarity, he describes it as a way of coming to an understanding of his father. And it's a complex story, yeah, yeah. and it's a serious issue. And I think Nicholas Frank has done more than anyone I know to tell the truth about what happened, because he lived it, he knows it. He's, he is just an amazing guy, and I remember... I remember first day I spent with him you know sort of halfway through the day he'd already smoked about 20 cigarettes um he'd, he'd given up for a while hadn't he? he he'd promised his wife when he got married he would give up until he was 65 and if he was still alive at 65 he'd start smoking again <laughs> yeah. I think I've got that right yeah um and so he's 65 that exactly right so, so, so 65 he starts smoking and how I mean he just smokes all the time anyway having gone round Varvel Castle he then then Started getting heart palpitations and feeling faint and and anyway, so I we took him to his cafe and sort of sat him down and, and stuff. He said, "Oh, well, you know, obviously what I need for this is." We said, "Well, you know, should we get you some aspirin or you know, should we get you some, you know, glass of water?" He said, "No, no, 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 I don't want a glass of water." You know, out there came the schnapps, another kind of six chain smoke more bereds. I mean, you know, it's just you know, I was worried he was going to keel over a heart attack on me, but you know, he, he's he's. And then that night, we kind of, you know, went out on the lash again. I mean, it was just great. Well, I mean, there are, there are many aspects of his life that are extraordinary. He invites me each year to the annual goose killing, yes. um, which I so far have not been able to go to. But I'm thinking this November, if travel <laughs> is open again, uh, there is a day of the year where apparently everyone in Germany kills a certain number of geese. I don't know what it's yeah. about, but <laughs> yeah. he invites me each year and uh, he's very disappointed with me for not coming. But there you are. Um, he is a special, special person. Is, is he unusual for um, uh, what you might call, because you, call, you called him the Prince of Poland earlier on. Is he unusual for the first generation descendants, you know, children of the Nazi brass, to be this um unequivocal in his condemnation to be this sort of front foot about about how he despises his parents and what they did and uh, because because every now and again you do you do see like uh, i think you, there's a there's a, a one of the goering children who pops up occasionally on these sort of my father the my father the nazi Edda. programs that you see um yeah and and some of them kind of go, oh, well, you know, different times and uh, nothing to do with me. Is, 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 is Nicholas Frank peculiar in the way he approaches this or is or, or, of a set of people who, are, who feel like this? No, I'd say he's unique. Um, and I think when his book came out in 1989 to go into a more serious moment, yeah. it caused a scandal because he was the first child of a senior Nazi, as I understand it, to break ranks to say my father did monstrous things, my father did international crimes, my father deserved to be hanged for what he did. And that lanced a boil. That allowed people to talk about it in a different way. Yeah. One of the curious things I learned in getting to know him is that many of the children of the upper echelons of the Nazis are still in contact with each other, not in a formalised sense, but they know each other, they're in touch, they send little messages, hence 
you know, my introduction to Horst Vester, which we'll come to in yeah. due course. Uh, but, so there is a point of connection, and I think the ferocity of his views, particularly in relation to his father, is unique. I, I'd say the relationship with his mother, Brigitte, is different and more complex. I think, I think I'm fair in saying he has a deep gratitude for his mother in this sense, that after the war ended after the 8th of May 1945, as I recall, he says to me, she never again looked back on the good old days. She realised it was over. They now lived in impecunious circumstances. She had children to bring up. She never once complained. And she died young in her 60s. A very, as he describes it to me, as I recall, a broken person with a very tough life. Yeah. And so I think he draws a distinction between mother and father. And um, and there is a sense that his mother did a remarkable thing in bringing up five children in those difficult circumstances. Yeah. And, and yet yeah. she was a rabid Nazi, anti-Semite, and, and, you know, not a very nice person, was she? Uh, she doesn't come across as too nice um, a person. Um, I think she was married to someone who was extremely difficult... Um, she was older than her husband. She enjoyed the power. That is plain. She, uh, when her husband asks for a divorce in 1942, she refuses it. Uh, and that's why he has to go to a higher authority, the highest authority, yeah. uh, to get permission. And Nicholas has a line about it. Uh, I'd rather be, you know, married to a hanged senior Nazi than um, the divorcee. Uh, of such a person. She was absolutely wedded to it and bought into the project and loved the contacts, the dinner parties. There's a great book, actually, one of the books of that period that I admire the most by a complex journalist in Italian called Curzio Malaparte. Mm, caput. A book he published, exactly, Caput, you've read it, and uh, Malaparte was a journalist for Corriere della Sera who was posted to Krakow in early 42 and stayed at the Vavel Castle with the Franks and got to know the Vechters also, actually. And in his novel, he calls it a novel, but I've compared the novel with his press reporting in Corriere, which was published in the spring of 42. There's obviously significant points of overlap. And he describes the dinner parties and the piano playing by... Frank and Frank's beautiful white hands and the wife's complaints about Frank and you are drawn into that world I mean it's like you being in the bathroom James yes you're there you're in that building you're at the dinner party you're drinking the fabulous wines you're sensing the opulence you're understanding that these people are masters of the universe and boom from one day to the next it's gone it's collapsed and Mrs Frank didn't complain she brought up her five kids. Mm. And I think Nick has a respect for what his mother did in that time. And, of course, she sold the portrait of a young man by Raphael as well to kind of make her way. <laughs> so we believe. So we believe. Still, being hunted, still being hunted. Still being hunted. And Somewhere in that cellar in Zurich. What, one of the things I, um, I wanted to ask you about, Philippe, is that, that all of these people we're talking about, or the, the, the principles we're talking about, Frank and Vechter, lawyers... They were they were no, no. men of the law, and there you are. Um, uh, what what on earth is going on with Nazism and the law? Because I know Frank Frank um, ended up going back to Berlin and, and lecturing about the the, the 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 state of law and the Nazi state's relationship with law and how that should work out, and and fell out um, uh, uh, quite badly with, with with Hitler over that. I believe later in the war. Yes, he did. Um, what what is the relation? What because after all, what they create in the in the um, uh, in Poland is is essentially a, a vacuum, a, a, li a lawless vacuum, so they can kind of do whatever they like, which is which what ex which what accelerates the, the Holocaust. What is the relationship between these people and the law, as you uh, as I might understand it, um, possibly anachronistically, and from a from a culture with a different jurisprudence um, tradition? What's going on there? It's a big, it's a really big question. And obviously it's one I spend a lot of time thinking about because I am a lawyer, because I give legal advice to governments. And I ask myself the question, right, government asked me to sign on the dotted line. What do I do? What are my responsibilities? Both Frank and Vechter were highly educated, highly cultured men. 
Frank was a personal friend of the composer Richard Strauss, who composed a song in his honour. Um, uh, they did well at law school. They, you know, so how do you, in those circumstances, cross a line? And essentially, I think what we learn is that lawyers are human beings too, <laughs> that they also want to go up the greasy pole and they are willing to do the necessary if it enables them to get up that greasy so, pole. And both these men were willing to do power it. Power and ambition but, is, is the big thing powering this. Well, power and ambition. In the case of Hans Frank, um, in particular, there is a story that Nicholas shares, which is semi-documented, that he had in his 20s had a, what would then have been called a homosexual experience. And his wife knew about it. And his wife dangled it over him with a threat that if he didn't carry on up the greasy pole, she, of course, had this deadly information on him. So remarkably, in 1935, he actually drafts the laws that criminalise homosexuality and lead to homosexuals, to gay people being sent to concentration camps and death camps. But he has his own story in that direction and his wife knows about it. And again, as Nicholas puts it in some of his accounts, she was able to dangle that over him. Mm. The relationship between husband and wife is one that is fascinating for me. I had, didn't explore it so much in relation to Hans and Brigitte Frank, but it is, of course, this for me, the central story of the Wächters, Otto and Charlotte. What was the role of the spouses? We've never really homed in on that. And I think we all know from our own lives, our significant others, our partners, have a hugely important role in our lives. When I get a case that raises questions in my mind, who do I turn to for advice? Hmm, don't really know about this one. What should I do? What's the right thing to do? I turn to my wife because I trust her judgment. Um, and I think a lot of people turn to their partners and the partner may or may not give the right advice. I think the spouses is the great untold story of that period and indeed of any period. I mean, to cut to the chase, right going up to the situation, you know, coming forward. We know in Argentina and Chile, the lawyers during those periods played an absolutely huge role. Um, I'm not comparing that to the Nazi period, but it was pretty bad. And then if we come into our own times, what we lived through, we lived through the Iraq war. Let me be crystal clear. I'm not saying the Iraq war is Nazi Germany or anything like that. But it turned on legal advice. And it turned on legal advice given by one individual to another individual, an attorney general to a prime minister. And in the rumour mill out there, of course, is the story of whether or not the spouse might have had a role in terms of the legal advice that was given or not. I don't know whether it was or not, but what I can tell you from my own personal experience and from those of my colleagues in straight relationships, in gay relationships, in other relationships, your partner is the person you turn to for the nod. And there is plenty of evidence in the Vechta story, in the diaries and in the letters, that Otto turned to Charlotte at certain critical moments and said, what should I do? Mm. Quote at the end of your book, isn't there, that says, um, I'm much more interested in the monster rather than the victim. And I'm, I'm sort of conscious that that's, that's exactly what the we've just done the in the last the half butcher, hour. The butcher rather than the victim, isn't it? The yeah. butcher rather than the victim. That's a quote. That's a quote from a very wonderful Spanish writer who plays an absolutely key role in the rat line. Um, your listeners should read, if they read one book, if you two guys read one book, read a book called Soldiers of Salabis by the Spanish writer Javier Cercas, C-E-R-C-A-S. It tells the story of a moment in the Spanish Civil War when a, uh, uh, when a Republican is about to execute a nationalist and their eyes make contact and something happens in that moment and the act of execution does not take place. And it, the novel then recreates that moment and tells the story 
of the search to understand what happened in that moment. Right. Javier is an incredible writer who melds fact and fiction. He is the person who gave me that extraordinary uh, quote. We were sitting together, I kid you not, in the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> How did we get into the Sistine Chapel on our own? We got in there because we're jumping a little bit, but let's jump to the death of Otto Wächter, Hans Frank's deputy. He dies in a hospital in Rome run by the Vatican. For three and a half years, I'm trying to gain access to that room, an extraordinary room, but it's closed to me. It's being refurbished, I'm told. No access, I can't get in. Then one day, Javier Cercas, Spanish writer, tells me, guess what? I've been invited to Rome. I've been invited to the Vatican by the Pope's office to give a lecture on faith and literature. I said, oh, that's terrific. If you happen to meet someone who might be able to get me into this hospital room where Wächter died, please assist me. So uh, he says, all right, all right. I don't think any more of it. I'm then wandering across the Dolomites with my daughter, uh, following in the footsteps of Otto Wächter's escape from Austria to Italy, when my phone goes, uh, once we get down into phone contact area, and it's, it's Javier Serkis. He says, you're not going to believe this, Philippe. I said, what? He said, I'm in Rome. I'm with the director of the Vatican Cultural Office and his number two, who's a terrific Irish bishop. Your name came up in conversation. I, Javier Serkis, said to the bishop, you, you know Philippe Sands. How do you know Philippe Sands? He said, well, I think he's the bloke I think he's the bloke who made that podcast called The Rat Line. Javier says, yes. The bishop says, I loved that podcast. Not very complimentary about the Vatican, but I have to say I loved it. I'd love to meet him. I flew down the next day. I was there the next day and I got access to the Vatican. Anyway, they introduced us to the Sistine Chapel and sitting there, I say to Javier Cercas, why am I so obsessed with this, this subject? Why does anyone care about what happened to Otto Wächter and his relationship with his wife? Javier turns to me in the Sistine Chapel, looks at me and says, because I'm more interested in the perpetrator than the victim. I'm more interested in the butcher than the victim. The rat line opens with those words from Javier Sergas. Well, well we, and we just writer. proved that precisely. Well, I'll tell you what, well, I'll tell you what, we'll, yeah. we'll, um, we'll talk about that um, uh, next week. Um, if you like. Um, thank you, Philippe. Um, absolutely fascinating. We hope you've enjoyed listening to this. We'll be more from Philip next week as we uh, talk about Otto Wächter, his loving wife, Charlotta, and of course, the rap line. Thank you for joining us. See you all soon. Cheerio. Cheerio. Cheerio.